Fallout 3 was the first Fallout that allowed the player character to explore a 3D open world environment. After 11 years of Fallout either being open world, but trimetric, or 3D, but linear, Fallout finally had a game map that was open world and fully 3D. Now, while vanilla Fallout 3 boasts a total of 163 locations marked on the Pip-Boy map, I'm more interested in those locations that do not appear on the Pip-Boy map. The unmarked locations. I've made videos about Fallout New Vegas unmarked locations and Fallout 4 unmarked locations. Naturally, a different game would come next. And that's exactly what I'll be doing today. Let's go over 5 plus 1 remarkable unmarked locations in Fallout 3. Sniper Shack. Let's start off with a little bonus location. Northeast of Vault 87, atop a mountain overlooking a pond, sits a rusted sheet metal shack. This is the Sniper Shack. Now, many of you might know the Sniper Shack already for a few reasons. One, it serves as the location for the fourth holotape as part of the Keller family unmarked quest. And two, locked behind a very hard locker within the small structure, is the Victory Rifle. The Victory Rifle is a unique but weaker variant of the Sniper Rifle that comes with a unique knockdown effect and increased durability. It's a neat little reward for those who like to do some good ol' explorin'. But the holotape and unique weapon are not the only thing interesting about the shack. There's more. Locked within a kennel or cage are, strangely, the only named rad roaches in Fallout 3. These are Fluffy and Jitters. And these guys have a few other unique characteristics as well. Now, unlike another caged mutant pet, Pumpkin the Mole Rat, Fluffy and Jitters are both hostile. This means that if they're released from the cage, or if you walk too close to the cage, they will attack the Lone Wanderer. This also means that companions will attack the rad roaches if they follow you into the sniper shack, so be careful with that. If this does happen and you're now sad that you lost your mean but cute friends, don't fret, as both rad roaches are flagged to respawn. And as far as I'm aware, these are the only named enemies that are able to do so. No other named enemy will respawn after some time. Once folks like the Drifter, Jabsco, or Arkansas perish, that's it. There's no coming back. But as mentioned, Jitters and Fluffy are abnormally assembled. So if you wait 72 in-game hours or so, both will be back in their cage, still hostile and ready to gnaw at your ankles. Just a lot of neat trivia surrounding these two roachy lads. They're the only named rad roaches in Fallout 3. Unlike Pumpkin, they're always hostile. And they're the only named enemies that will respawn. I think that makes for a good bonus location, don't you think? Now on to the main five. Rockopolis. The adventures of Herbert Daring Dashwood and his ghoul manservant Argyle is a post-war radio play hosted on Three Dogs Galaxy News Radio. The play is split into four parts that can be heard when tuning into the radio station on the Lone Wanderer's Pip-Boy. The story opens with Daring and Argyle imprisoned within the slaver town of Paradise Falls. Argyle manages to unlock the duo's slave collars. Before they escape the town, however, Daring, against the wishes of Argyle, attempts to free a lady who is captured alongside them. In their rescue attempt, they are ambushed by a slaver. The lady, who we learned is named Penelope Chase, had already freed herself and counter-ambushes the slaver, rescuing the daring duo. The three flee Paradise Falls together. End of part one. Part two opens with the trio having dispatched the last of the raiders who gave chase. As Daring and Argyle are getting to know Penelope, they are ambushed by super mutants. Argyle reverse pickpockets a grenade into the pocket of a super mutant, providing a distraction for the group to, once again, flee. End of part two. Part three opens with the trio running away from the chasing super mutants. Penelope recognizes a specific grouping of rocks and questions if that's where the hidden village of Rockopolis is located. She curses, if only they knew how to get in, they could escape the super mutants. Well, it turns out that both Daring and Argyle have been to Rockopolis and know the secret knock to get in. 
In an attempt to impress Miss Chase, Daring reveals this information. With the group now safely within the confines of the hidden village of Rockopolis, Penelope reveals her true identity. She turns out to be the Black Widow, the leader of the Paradise Falls slavers. End of part 3. Part 4 opens with a standoff. Penelope has her weapon aimed at the duo. As Penelope tells the pair not to make any sudden movements, Argyle hits her with the eagle claw, punching straight through her chest and ripping her heart out. It turns out that Penelope was heartless. That is a completely original joke by me. Don't bother listening to the radio play yourself. I made that joke. I'm a funny guy. Anyway, all the commotion alerted the ruler of Rockopolis, King Crag. Daring and Argyle relay the bad news, that slavers will arrive any second. This rightfully infuriates old Craggy Boy. In response, he commands his people to destroy the two. Daring and Argyle flee deeper into Rockopolis. They come across a cliff that needs to be jumped across. Daring leaps and manages to grab the edge of the cliff, where he does his best to hang on. End of part 4. It ends with Daring hanging on to a cliff. It ends on a literal cliffhanger. Now, why did I give the cliff notes, pun intended, for the adventures of Herbert Daring Dashwood and his ghoulish manservant, Argyle? Well, while the events of the play are formatted and dramatized in a similar way to any old radio play, according to Dashwood himself, it is entirely true. West of Smith Case's garage, you will come across an inconspicuous rock formation. Nothing would seem out of the ordinary if it were not for the coat hanger and decorations hanging up outside. Welcome to Rockopolis. The super secret settlement from the radio play is real. Sometime between the Great War and 2248, the Kingdom of Rockopolis was founded. In the summer of 2248, the cave's ruler, King Crag, would provide shelter to Herbert Dashwood and Argyle. An incident involving the king's daughter would lead to the exiling of the duo. They would return a couple years later. Herbert writes in his exploration database terminal, We sought shelter again a couple years later, but Craggy didn't take too kindly to us luring the slavers into his hidden underground city. That was the last time I ever saw Argyle, right after he saved my hide for the hundredth time. When the Lone Wanderer enters Rockopolis, you're met with a small area with some miscellaneous objects. A tunnel leading to, assumedly, the rest of Rockopolis is sealed off by some debris. Nearby, the corpse of Argyle can be found. Next to him is the unarmed Bobblehead, referring to his eagle claw punch that killed Penelope Chase. While the exact events of their escapade in Rockopolis will never be confirmed, it would seem that Herbert managed to escape thanks to the efforts and sacrifice of the stalwart ghoul manservant, Argyle. A holotape titled Rollings Were Done is the final clue as to what happened to Rockopolis. Rollings. That's the last of these effing hole dwellers. Jurley wants to shop them around up north. Not sure if they'll make good slaves since their eyesight is so bad. But that's not our problem. So gather the boys and saddle up. Next stop the pit. It would seem that the slavers captured the residents of Rockopolis with the intention of selling them to Asher's raider gang in the pit. This holotape would foreshadow the central conflict of the game's second DLC. There you go, a lot of cool stuff with this unmarked location. Validates Herbert's grand adventuring tales, solves the mystery of what happened to Argyle, is the location for a bobblehead, and foreshadows a DLC. Pretty remarkable, eh? Internment Truck this next location is likely the most messed up on the list, and its inclusion in Fallout 3 is actually in reference to real-life events. Along the highway east of Sat Comrade NWOC7, a broken-down semi-truck takes up two lanes. As one proceeds towards the back end of the truck, towards its trailer, one will notice several corpses strewn about. What is already a morbid scene only gets worse when one reads the nearby holotape. USMC Private Contract PRV MIL 3482B Official Orders from Department of Defense Contractors Eyes Only Under Penalty of Treason In accordance with Executive Order 99066, transport specified civilians to WRA Site PA32. Use of non-lethal force is authorized only when required to enforce this contract. 
Transport arrival is required by October 29, 2077. Present these orders to Chief MP at WRA site perimeter for admission and unloading. The tape then lists seven individuals, Y Guo, A He, H X Ming, M Pang, M Pang Jr., R Chong, and H K Sen. The centuries-old skeletons are actually apprehended Chinese-American citizens destined for internment camp WRA, War Relocation Authority, Site PA-32. Now what's interesting is that, while we never see WRA Site PA-32 in-game, two other internment camps do appear. The Turtle Dove Detention Camp in Point Lookout, and Little Yangtze in New Vegas's Old World Blues. It would be at these locations that suspected Chinese agents, sympathizers, and prisoners of war would be interrogated, experimented on, or forced to work in abysmal conditions. Order 99066, the one mentioned in the internment truck holotape, would seem to have authorized the unlawful detainment and relocation of suspected Chinese and communist sympathizers. Order 99066 is a clear reference to the real-life executive order 9066. Signed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt two months after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, Order 9066 would authorize the relocation of Japanese and Japanese-American citizens to be placed in what the order called relocation centers. Over 120,000 people of Japanese descent were gathered up and moved to concentration camps. As one might expect, the living conditions of the camps were horrid. A 1943 WRA report notes that the inmates were housed in a tar paper covered barracks of simple frame construction without plumbing or cooking facilities of any kind. It would be on December 17, 1944, nearly two years after the initial internment of Japanese Americans, that Roosevelt would rescind Order 9066, after the Supreme Court had ruled that the incarceration of citizens loyal to the United States, regardless of cultural descent, could not be lawfully detained. To awkwardly bring this back to Fallout, who knew that a random, unmarked truck could provide so much Fallout lore while also referencing a dark moment in American history? Let's move on to something that might lighten the mood. Exploding Scientist Truck Coincidentally, this location actually isn't too far from the internment truck. On an elevated highway between Satcom Array and W07C and Broadcast Tower KB5, you'll come across another semi-truck battered and broken across two lanes of traffic. A ramp to the entrance of the trailer invites you to explore. As you approach the truck, you may hear an explosion and see a body fly out of the trailer. This location has been termed by many as the Exploding Scientist Truck. Fitting name, eh? If you see where the scientist landed, it could be on the freeway, it could be underneath, and it could be both, you should probably go check on them, see if they're okay, you know? Well. After an explosion like that, they're probably not okay, but the Big Book of Science skillbook that they're carrying is fine, so be sure to snag that. If you're brave enough to enter where you just saw a corpse fly out, you'll be met by a crude living space. A table, chair, and mattress are found at the elevated portion near the front of the trailer. Along the sides are shelves and some workbenches. Curious enough, there's not much indication of what exactly could have caused the explosion. Perhaps the scientist was tinkering with the laser rifle found inside the truck, poked and prodded where they should have prodded and poked, and wound up like the Foo Fighters, learning to fly. Perhaps their terminal spontaneously combusted. I'm not sure what's inside a terminal and follow to make it cause a large explosion though. Or perhaps it was something to do with the lone mini nuke found in the trailer. Perhaps said mini nuke had a brother, a companion. It all seems a bit odd, doesn't it? Still, the unlucky chaps seem to have been messing with something that they should not have been messing with, causing them to be blasted out of their makeshift home, making for a slightly humorous, slightly ominous encounter. La Maison Beauregard Time to show off my French language skills. At the southernmost part of the northern Washington DC neighborhood, Georgetown, one will find La Maison Beauregard. La Maison Beauregard is a high-class, eight-story hotel. Once upon a time, guests would be greeted by receptionists, bellhops, and concierges who would cater to every whim. Now, hopeful guests are instead greeted by brutes, masters, and overlords, as a group of super mutants have since taken up residence. Relative to some of its contemporaries, it's not in bad shape. I mean, for one, it's still standing with minimal damage after two centuries, a marvel of civil engineering. 
and two were allowed to actually go inside the building, a rarity among some of the downtown buildings. But the incredulity of the building's structural strength isn't the reason the building makes this list, no. It makes this list thanks to an unmarked quest that was actually added in Fallout 3's third DLC, Broken Steel. On your way to attack the Eastern Enclave's secondary HQ, Adams Air Force Base, you travel through the presidential metro. Before you get to the train that'll take you to the base, if you wander up a flight of stairs, you'll eventually find a holotape next to a skeleton on a bench. Titled Sorry My Darling, the tape is from the perspective of a distressed woman. She pleads to whoever is listening to give this tape to her lover at La Maison Beauregard Hotel. She notes that, despite trying to get away, they've found her. She mentions that she will never get the chance to see the gift her lover got her, and apologizes for all the lives lost to this thing. It's all quite vague. I'll play the full tape so you can get a feel for what I mean. Go to the time on screen to skip it. If someone finds this, please get this to my lover at the Maison Beauregard Hotel in East Georgetown. He'll want to hear what I have to say. My darling, they found me. I tried to get away. I tried to get away so we could be together once again. I know you risked your life to get it to me. Combing the ruins, avoiding the super mutants. All for me. It seems I shall never lay my eyes upon your gift. You, you'll have to keep it and remember me every time you see it. I'm so sorry, my darling. So, so sorry I've let you down. So many have died for this thing. So many hearts have been broken. Please remember, I'll always love you. You will be with me forever, in my spirit. I... I... I love you. I love you. See what I mean? Very cryptic. Leave your theories in the comments. If, after listening to the holotape you travel to La Maison Beauregard, you'll encounter the late woman's lover, a man named Lagbolt. Lagbolt is a unique hostile enemy. Based on the sigil on his combat armor, he appears to be part of Talon Company, the Capital Wasteland's mercs for hire. After dispatching the strong screw, his corpse contains a few unique items. First is the aforementioned combat armor, creatively dubbed Lagbolt's Combat Armor. His garb gives an additional 6 damage reduction when compared to the default combat armor. It also provides 10 AP and 10 skill points to big guns. The next notable piece of loot are his spectacles, Lagbolt's Shades. These bad boys give plus 3 to lockpick and sneak, not bad at all. And the last important piece of loot that Lagbolt was carrying was the key to Lagbolt's suitcase. If you take that key and bring it to the suitcase that can be found on the hotel's pool table, you'll find what Lagbolt's gift to his lover was. A unique set of naughty nightwear dubbed the All-Nighter Nightwear. The nightwear gives plus one to both charisma and endurance. Listening to the holotape, then going to La Maison Beauregard and killing Lagbolt is the only way to acquire these three unique apparel pieces. That is the reason it makes this list. On to the final unmarked location. And our final remarkable unmarked location in Fallout 3 is the Hidden Irradiated Pool, also referred to by some as Isabella Proud's Camp. If you travel through the Vernon Square East Metro, you'll come out at a small shopping center known as Tacoma Park. Within Tacoma Park is an Abraxo Cleaner manufacturing plant known as Tacoma Industrial. Then in the back of Tacoma Industrial, after a bit of trailblazing, you'll come to an irradiated crater that has since formed a pond and Isabella Proud's camp. The camp itself isn't very impressive, consisting of a crude metallic tent, some basic medical supplies, and a mattress. Nearby, the corpses of two scientists, Isabella and Jason, can be found. Neither are carrying anything noteworthy. Unlike some of the other locations on this list, you wouldn't come here for some stellar or rare loot. Instead, this is a lore-only location. Let's go. A terminal found at the camp shed some light on what Isabella and Jason were up to. 
the first entry is titled Day 45, indicating that their work had already been going on for a month and a half. Jason found a terminal suitable to our needs in the nearby ruins. With some work, we may be able to move this workstation closer to where our research has been taking place. Must keep an eye out for a portable source of power. Must remember to translate my notes onto this thing when I have some time to do so. While Jason was scavenging in the ruins, I caught a glimpse of the group by the pool in the afternoon. Contrary to what most people think, they don't fear the daylight at all, but they do seem to prefer indoor habitats. We learn right away that Isabella and Jason are conducting research on a specific pack of ghouls, doing their best to document their behaviors. The second entry comes six days after the first, day 51. I've conducted an informal experiment this week. I've filled some heavy basins with water, each with different levels of radiation. Consistent with my prediction, they seem to prefer water with high rad content. Thanks to these radiation suits, I was able to irradiate one of the basins with a typically lethal level of radiation, and, to my amazement, this has worked better than any of our attempts at constructing a lure to attract them into our research area. This is very exciting. The next notable entry comes one week later. Day 58. Amazing, today I was approached by one of them. I've decided to call her Melinda. I'm not actually sure if there's a way to establish gender, but Melinda moved in a way that appeared very feminine to me. She caught me off guard while I was checking water levels in the experimental basins. For a moment there, I wish I had taken that damned pistol Jason insisted upon me carrying. She grasped my arm, but instead of attacking, she appeared to sniff my arm where some of the scavenged resin I've been using to irradiate the basins had spilled on my suit. Moments later, she was gone. Must consider some way of tagging them. Day 63. No sign of the group for days. Could Melinda have returned to the group with some news of our brief encounter? Perhaps they're scared of us. Jason's beginning to get concerned, but I believe we're close to learning what we came here for. The poor man's been through hell for me. I don't know if I could have achieved so much without him, but there's so much left to learn. Day 67. I insisted on sleeping at the research site last night, much to Jason's protest. I'm sure I saw motion in the far ruins, but the moon had slid behind a cloud so I couldn't make out for certain their shapes. I don't think mutants would have moved like that, and most people in the city know enough to hunker down at night. Could it have been our group, returning home? Day 68. Slept outdoors again last night. Jason insisted on staying with me this time, and built a camouflage screen for us to sleep in. I irradiated the main body of water as heavily as I could to try and draw them out. My plan seemed to have worked because I saw a few. I think Melinda was among them, come into the open at dusk and settle in the water. After dark, one I believe to be the alpha male, I've called him Samuel, emerged with the rest of the group. I had to switch my Geiger counter off when he arrived to avoid being heard. I can't imagine the radiation levels the glowing ones must be infused with. I think that must be why he's the alpha. The others are so drawn to him because of his immense radiation. Day 75. I need to make contact again. I've coated my suit in resin and will try approaching the group tomorrow at dusk. Observation hasn't revealed anything new. Direct contact is required if I'm going to continue to learn about them. I know Jason would never understand, but this won't work if his suit isn't also irradiated. I'll coat it while he's gone scavenging during the afternoon, and will set up camp tonight by the water before dusk. Day 75 is the final entry. It would seem that Isabella's plan to intentionally irradiate her radiation suit didn't have the desired outcome. I'd wager that the radiation suit couldn't protect them from the high-intensity intentional radioactive sabotage and the pair perished from radiation sickness. But the coolest part about this location comes when you finish reading the entries. After exiting from the terminal, a glowing one will appear. Their name? Samuel. That's right, alpha male of the ghoul pack Samuel appears and will attack on sight. While Samuel isn't any more stronger than a typical glowing one, this secretive pseudo-boss battle is a unique encounter that some may have missed. And that is 5 remarkable unmarked locations in Fallout 3. Did I miss any of your favorites? Want me to cover them in a potential part 2? Leave your suggestions in the comments. We've covered Fallout 4, Fallout New Vegas, and now Fallout 3, so I think you all know which game comes next. Though, that won't be for a bit. I want to cover some other things too, you know? Thanks for listening. That's all from me today, folks. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. He did it in the style of those shows they had before the war. 
came out pretty well. And it's all true. Rockopolis, Miss Chase, all of it.